All right. Welcome, everyone. Everyone should be filing in here. Hi, I'm Liz Kennedy. I'm here at the Gazette. And I want to welcome you guys to uh, Behind the Lens, our first ever virtual Behind the Lens, uh, capturing derecho. Everybody should be on mute. Um, and if you have any issues, troubleshoot, you can just uh, put that in the chat too. I could try to help you out. Okay, uh, so we are really proud that we were able to um, give a portion of proceeds from the uh, derecho book to Project Relief, um, which is gonna help Cedar Rapids rebuild its tree canopy. And I have with me today, Lisa Williams from Trees Forever, uh, part of the Planting Hope uh, project at Trees Forever. And Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about um, this program and how people can learn more? Yes, thank you very much to the Gazette. Um, thank you all also to the talented photojournalists, the reporters, the editors, the carriers who delivered the paper. And even though all of you were working so hard, you also suffered personal loss as a result of the storm. Thanks to everyone who purchased this beautiful book. We are honored to accept this donation to help replant our city. If you'd like more information about the project to replant our beautiful canopy of trees, just go to treesforever.org slash planting hope. Thanks so much again. All right, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Mary Sharp is going to take it away, Mary. Hi, hi folks. Uh, I'm your host for tonight's program. Thank, thank you for joining us. We journalists aren't that accustomed to speaking to people, but we'll do our best. Uh, <laughs> Oh, tonight we're going to go behind the lens and talk to the four Gazette photojournalists who took the pic pictures that are featured in the Gazette's Derecho Picture Book. We, we produced this book for one reason. The August 10th Derecho is something we'll remember for the rest of our lives and whose effects we'll be dealing with for decades. The Gazette in 2008 produced a keepsake book after the great flood of 2008. In September, our executive editor, Zach Kucharski, decided we should do the same for the August 10th duration. Zach asked me and Liz Martin to pull together the book. Liz is the Gazette's senior photojournalist I was the newspaper city editor for 16 years and then retired and that I'm back working part-time on the copy desk. Liz and I worked with graphic designer, Chad Willenborg, who designed and pulled together a 155 page book, Color Web Printers, which is also part of Foliance, the Gazette's parent company, produced the book. We had so many orders, we actually had to get some help printing. So tonight, brace yourself, we'll be revisiting those days and nights when we had no electricity, cell phones or internet. The day an inland hurricane tore off our roofs, flattened our crops and leveled our trees. It was a day a lot of us learned a new word, derecho. The Gazette's photo staff took more than 10,000 images of the damage, the aftermath and the recovery, work that continues today. From those 10,000 images, 1,000 were submitted for publication in the Gazette and Gazette Online. Many were shared with the Associated Press for publication in the United States and internationally. And from those 1,000 images, Liz Martin and her staff selected 195 pictures for the Derecho book, which we arranged in 12 chapters. From the start, the goal was to tell a story. Yes, we had indescribable damage and loss, but we also had such kindness and community. We wanted to show as much of that as possible. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, they, they say I, that uh, 
newspapers and online sites are the rough draft of history. And that's, and that's what the folks, these talented, hardworking people provided us. They were out there in the storm. They were out there when they couldn't get around trees. They, it, it, they're just awesome what they did. So it's my pleasure to introduce them to you. Uh, I don't know of a harder working bunch of people ever. So Liz Martin, my co-editor of the book, supervises the four person photo staff. Liz grew up in Oklahoma in St. Louis. She joined the Gazette in 2007 after graduating from the University of Missouri School of Journalism. She's photographed about everything regional and local news, sports division, one athletics, presidential caucuses, the 2008 flood, the, uh, the derecho and the pandemic. Andy Abeda grew up in Portland. He became interested in photography in high school and then studied journalism at the University of Oregon. He was an intern for the Gazette because he wanted to cover the 2016 Iowa caucuses. He interned for the Peoria newspaper before becoming a full-time photojournalist for the Quad City Times Davenport for three years. He joined the Gazette photo staff in September of 2019. Rebecca F. Miller grew up in Decorah and graduated from the University of Iowa in 2006 with, get this, she studied German and literature, science, and the arts. She's a Fulbright Fellow. She moved to Berlin, where she taught English, translated, and worked as a freelance photographer. She came back to the United States to earn a master's in photojournalism at Ohio University. And then she was off to Germany again to intern at the large daily newspaper in Potsdam. She came back to the US, worked for Ohio University for a while and came to the Gazette in 2016. Jim Slazarek, uh, I've worked with Jim for 20 years now. Jim grew up in suburban Milwaukee and began his photojournalism career with the AP Associated Press and a chain of weekly papers in suburban Milwaukee. He worked for the Waukesha Freeman and the Racine Journal Times. He joined the Gazette in August 2000. He has covered six presidents, scores of presidential candidates, the Green Bay Packers, Major League Baseball, the Super Bowl, Division I college sports, and the NCAAs. His, but his favorite memory, he says, was paddling down the Cedar River with writer Orlin Love after the 2008 flood. I'd like to kick off uh, the photos now by asking Liz Martin to talk about the process of selecting one image out of these thousands for the cover of the Derecho book. Liz, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Mary. That was quite an introduction. Hopefully we, uh, we do that justice. Uh, like Mary said, uh, we are going to start by doing kind of a very quick overview of some of the images that we considered for the cover of the book. Um, if you're not familiar with the book, it, that image I'm sure you've seen everywhere, especially when you uh, RSVP. So here is a very brief overview of a few of the images that we considered for the cover of the book. And don't worry, you will see all of these images again when the photographers discuss them in detail. So that's obviously a very tight edit. Uh, we, we came to that because by that point we were already quite familiar with all of the work that we had. Uh, and what we were really trying to convey very quickly on this cover was uh, the enormity of the storm, but how do you do that in one image? So really what it came down to was this photo that Andy Abeda took um, of a woman in here in Cedar Rapids and just her reaction to the storm. And this was taken the night of the storm. Um, when I look at this photo, I feel like I'm immediately back on August 10th. Um, yes, this photo doesn't have some of the most severe damage that Cedar Rapids saw 
but I think through this image, we've really, uh, we, we feel this shared story. And I think that really is what this book is about. So from here, I'm going to turn it over to Andy uh, to discuss uh, his experiences starting, uh, starting the day of the storm. Oh, Liz, I'll um, get butt in for just a minute here. Sorry, Andy. The other thing about the cover, if you can go back to that, is there had to be room for a title. You know, it's a, where do you put the title of a book? The image you'll see next from Andy is, a, is dramatic, but where do you put the title of the book and not spoil the image? Just the button, okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that you'll see through most of our images as, as photojournalists, we're always filling the frame. So uh, having an image with that open space was a challenge. So thanks. Here we go, on to Andy. Hey, thank you. Um, so starting, I mean, this is my very first image uh, of the DeRay show before any of us, or at least before I knew what the heck was going on. Uh, I started the day in Iowa City covering a protest. Um, students protesting about going back to in-person class. And it got a little thunderstorm warning, which if anyone around here knows we get all the time. <laughs> so I kind of just, I was on my way, already in the car. Uh, I didn't pay attention to it. Again, we get them all the time. So I'm driving up and obviously quickly realized this is a much different storm. Um, but I'm already on the freeway and <laughs> happened to be running low on gas. So I just kept going and going. And this was the first of what ended up being several overturned semis that I saw personally. I think I counted six between this one and, and my exit to get home. Um, but when I pulled up, no one, no one, none of this was happening yet. No one was there. Uh, so I assumed it had just happened and the driver was still stuck. Um, so behind the trailer, I pulled in where I was safe and ran back to try and help. Uh, and by the time I'd gotten there to help, these two men had jumped out of their vehicles and were helping. And this woman was, she, I, I don't even know her name. Um, she's a nurse, she told me, and they were on it. And I realized I was about to kind of get in the way trying to help. So at that point I stepped back, looked around to see if I could do anything else, if we were safe out of traffic and uh, had nothing else to do. So I pulled out my phone and ended up taking, I think I took three photos and then switched over to video that I immediately put on Twitter. But I mean, that's, <laughs> As, as quick as you can react and kind of telling of the moment. I mean, it caught us all by surprise. I, I wasn't anticipating working in this moment. Um, I just realized I had nothing, nothing else to help with. And the driver did, um, this man on the right uh, rips the windshield open as the driver on the inside's kicking it. Um, I think the man on top of the truck had just passed him a hammer to try to break it open from the inside. The driver got out and seemed completely fine. And then the nurse took him into her car to wait together and she checked him out further um, as an ambulance was on its way. Um, but a pretty dramatic start <laughs> to the storm for me. Um, and then this is that evening. Um, this is just down the street from me. I'd gotten that initial photo through, uh, which became the front page of the next day's paper and kind of got some other work done. And then I ran out of uh, battery. I didn't have power, of course. Checked on checked on my house and everything. Uh, I was pretty much fine. Um, I had nothing else to do. You know, we didn't have power. My laptop was was dying. Um, I could barely send a few photos in um, to the system you know, through our system because you know Wi-Fi was out. Cell phone signal was bad. So I just took a walk in the neighborhood, and this is kind of the first thing I saw. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's what I went to next. I think, oh, is Rebecca? Um, then this, this is Rebecca. Um, I was actually out during the storm as well. Um, I was off the week of the derecho. Um, so the day that the derecho hit, I was actually on my way to get a COVID test at the testing site, um, which we've been doing all summer long at that point, um, just to have peace of mind um, when interacting with the public, because we do that. We've had to continue doing that throughout the pandemic. Um, but I didn't realize that the testing sites were actually closed that day 
because of the coming storm. So I got there, the site was closed and I turned around, it was like driving up Bowling Street in Cedar Rapids. And I remember my mom had texted me, um, similar to Andy's story, um, I hope you're at home. There's, there's a storm coming, there's weather coming. And I was like, it's just a storm. She says this all the time. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I had the same reaction. So I kept driving and then the wind picked up and I remember a tree falling on top of my car. And I was like, this is different. Um, so I got up as far as if anybody knows that area of Cedar Rapids very well, there's a Dairy Queen across like kitty corner from a high V um, off of Bowling Street. And I pulled up on the lee side of that and just like hunkered down with like five other cars as the storm passed. And um, I could see the Czech National Cemetery across the street from me and trees just, just snapping in half and the flagpoles just looking like they were gonna break in half. So this, this photo that and like my camera was in the back of my my car, um, which is where I usually keep it. And I was terrified of the wind. It was just so intense that I didn't want to like, I don't know, I just, I didn't want to move. Um, so as soon as it kind of rolled over, I I like climbed over the seats to the, the cameras in my car and um, just like kind of shot what I could from my, from my front window and um and then realized like oh I have to like I need to go home and check on my house my dog was home alone by himself um so yeah this was at the start of my my trip trying to get home and this is looking down um Bowling Street um which you know just a mess at that point this was out you know what I'm talking about there were trees down and power lines down so um yeah it was kind of crazy trying to trying to get home from there is the next one me too Liz no okay uh nope so this is me so I was actually at the Gazette's new office uh when the storm rolled in the managers were there touring and and checking out our our new digs my car was parked on the street uh and the storm rolled in. And again, you know, like Andy said, we all expected like, this is just a, it's a thunderstorm, like no big deal. We'll wait it out. Well, there was no waiting it out. Uh, I watched as debris from the US bank fell on top of my car, um, which would ultimately be declared totaled. Um, and as soon as it was safe to do so, and after kind of talking through the game plan with uh, the rest of the managers, I tried to get home. I live in Wellington Heights and um, we have a lot of wonderful giant old trees, all of which were covering every single route that I had to get home. So I parked my car at the gas station there on uh, 15th and Mount Vernon Road. And this was immediately across the street. So um, I grabbed my camera gear, put on my rain jacket and I, uh, you know, headed out on foot. Um, I think I actually only had one battery or one card or something. I was ill prepared because, you know, I was only leaving the house to go to a meeting. Um, along the way, I still kind of didn't really know like what kind of storm we were looking at. There was a lot of standing water and I came across this, this man trying to coax his dog. I've completely forgotten the man's name, uh, but the dog's name is Blue. And I really, <laughs> I really sympathized with Blue in this moment. Um, Eventually I was able to get home. I did the same as the others have said. I filed my photos using what cell signal I had, um, using what battery power I had. And then I heard a chainsaw outside. Um, you actually can see my house in the upper left-hand corner of this frame. Uh, so I head out to photograph this man starting to clear the street. And then I find out this man actually was the carpenter on my house when it was renovated a few years ago. <laughs> um, and he is also a neighbor of mine. So. You know, even this was a very early look at kind of the way that everyone would just chip in where they needed to, to get the roads cleared, to get damage repaired, um, you know, to get the trees out of the way. This guy just came in and got it done. At that point, um, after filing, I needed to get back to my car and I also just wanted to see what else was happening. So I continued walking through the neighborhood. Um, I actually headed north up to Coe College 
I don't remember where exactly I saw this truck, but this would become a very common sight. And now we're back to Andy's cover image, um, if he would like to uh, talk about the creation of this photo. Yeah, so uh, as I kind of left off with, I got through my photos um, and then I'm sitting at home, you know, I, I checked on the house and it was, <laughs> we were blocked in, you couldn't get to the side door or the front door without doing kind of a, a maze limbo combo. Um, but the house was fine, everything was, I couldn't do anything else uh, in the moment. So I just took a walk in the neighborhood a lot, like Liz is saying, like I, I knew driving was gonna be next to impossible, but I can just grab my two cameras and take a walk. Um, so this is a neighbor down the street from me, actually. Uh, actually, if I look out the window right here in my office to the right, I can actually see her home. She's got a new roof now, um, doing better. I just talked to her the other day. Um, but yeah, this was the scene a lot of neighbors uh, trying to make sense of things and she was at least just trying to clear the yard. Um, she walked me through some of the damage, but this ended up being the moment from talking with her that, that, you know, as Liz mentioned earlier, kind of expressed, kind of expressed how I think we were all feeling. Um, yeah, I, I just spent some time with her and um, this is kind of what everyone was doing, just clearing and, and trying to make sense of it. So Jim Solzarek was off on Monday, but he joined back in with us. I think this is taken on Tuesday, um, if Jim wants to jump in. Yeah, this was at uh, Marion Square Park. Um, Governor Kim Reynolds came to the city um, to tour the damage. And uh, you know, you're always looking for kind of iconic photographs when you're out, um, or out and about. And I noticed this flag up in a tree and just the, the, the devastation at the park and to the pavilion um, was pretty, pretty incredible. So I thought it was just a nice detail. Uh, this is back to me. This is actually, um, we started working out of our printing facility on Bowling Street. And this is me now trying to get there because I still had no power, no generator yet. And um, no, I, I have notoriously bad cell signal around my house anyway. So really no signal at all. Um, so I'd taken photos for the day and was trying to make it back and find a road that was open um, to get back to the office and file some photos and, and came across this as one of many roadblocks, but this was another uh, I think anyone here remembers seeing power lines down everywhere and cars driving over power lines, people getting way too comfortable with them. But uh, this was just the reality and I thought this was a, a good example of it. Uh, this is that same trip. Uh, a few blocks later, uh, I made it to find this man uh, grilling in his front yard because that was kind of the only way to cook and his backyard was covered and uh, I think he'd had I want to say five trees fall down. Um, so he just brought the grill out front and was getting uh, any meat they had in the house that was going to go bad and just cooking up everything he could for him and his extended family. He had some extended family with him, I believe. Um, just kind of making the best of it. This was out in Keystone um, on August 12th, it was our first opportunity to kind of get out into the, the rural parts of our coverage area. Um, we heard some reports that Keystone was a uh, pretty, pretty hard hit. Um, so I was sent out there to see what was going on. Um, I just really liked the scale between the front end loader and the, the grain bins and just the, the destructive, it just really shows the destructive force of, of the storm. This is Richard Ortega and his son, Aiden. Um, he's a volunteer firefighter for Keystone. And like many of the other firefighters, they each took shifts um, between helping the community pick up and clean up and 
repairing damage to their own homes. Um, he and his son are actually tarping over a giant hole in the back of their house where part of their neighbor's garage blew off and rolled over their house. Um, it actually, the, the silver tarp behind him, actually that's where Aiden's bedroom is. So if Aiden was home and in his room at the time, it probably wouldn't have ended too well. So on the way back from Keystone, you could just see fields of flattened corn. And I just tried to put more of an artistic spin angle to the picture. Um, it's very difficult to photograph flattened corn from the ground, but I think you can really tell the, the extent of the damage from the stripped, stripped leaves and you can get a hint for, for the flattened corn in the background. Um, this is out in Martell, the River Valley Cooperative um, lost one of its grain bins as well. And there was just, I, I went out there a couple days before this. Um, I, I think we went up in the, in the plane maybe 10 days or so after the derecho hit, is that right? Um, and I had already been out to see this location from the ground level. And um, like Jim said, it's a, it's a totally different I idea trying to represent damage of that scale um, when you're at the ground level. Um, and like with this one, I was kind of looking at the graphic nature of the corn um, and just trying to kind of with the ground level one represent the sort of immense the immensity of the scale. But here you can, um, like when, when you're above in an, in an airplane looking down, you can, I mean, you really get the full effect of that scale. Um, which is why we decided, I think, to go, to go up and see some of this stuff from, from above. Um, this photo, especially, is is probably one of my like most memorable ones from the from our my coverage. Um, it's because I had been so um, just you're just su surrounded by all of the da damage and destruction, and it was everywhere, and it was kind of overwhelming. And um, I didn't, it didn't quite hit me the, the force and strength of the wind until I saw this, which was just like, you know, you can, that's a grain bin over on the left hand side of the frame. And it had, it had like been blown so forcefully through this field of, of beans, it looks like that um, it left, you know, marks where it rolled along the way. And I just, I was just blown away by the, literally, um, by the, the force of, of nature that we had all experienced and it. Yeah, it was just incredible. Um, so again, Jim was talking about how hard it is to represent um, flattened corn from the ground. It's, it's also hard to do it from above, but by the time we went up into the plane um, and it was just me and a pilot up there. Um, and I was able to, it was just, just a little plane. I could crack the window open. So I'm literally, when I say I'm up in a plane, I was like, have the uh, 70 to 200 lens. Um, I didn't want anything longer because I wasn't sure about the wind speed and I didn't want it to like pull the camera down and 
lose a, an expensive lens in the process. So 70 to 200, and I'm literally like hanging out the side of, uh, of the plane, um, shooting, shooting down along the side with the window cracked open um, so that there wasn't glass in the way. Um, and so by, by this time, you could see a lot more of the of the crop damage because of the um, because the sun had dried dried some of the dead crops up. Um, here again, just an, an an entire farm obliterated by wind, um, which is just amazing. And I kept thinking, like, oh, what a pain this is going to be for farmers as they're as they're harvesting and tilling next year. All of this crap in their fields. I just I feel for anyone who has to deal with that. Um, so on, I believe this was Wednesday after the storm, um, I headed out on the northwest side of Cedar Rapids. And this was a neighborhood that I covered extensively after the flood of 2008. We had each kind of been assigned like a neighborhood or a quadrant back then. And um, so I knew that, you know, I was familiar enough with the lay of the land that hopefully I would be able to, to do some justice to it. And you know, while ultimately what we're really looking for is for images that show the human impact and the people who were affected, um, photos like this, you know, were you just saw this on every single block of these trees that were just completely uprooted um, in this really unnatural, in, you know, just really crazy way. And um, you know, any of our viewers who are from Cedar Rapids know this, but maybe we have some who aren't. But Cedar Rapids has had a beautiful very old tree canopy with so many trees that were decades or hundreds of years old in these very established neighborhoods. So it really is shocking to see so many of these stately trees just, just gone, completely uprooted. Um, as I walked, basically I was walking with a reporter and we just walked all the way down probably Ellis and then all the way back on on one of the lettered streets. And I kind of just stopped anytime that I saw something interesting happening. And three people taking to this giant, uh, you know, tree trunk that probably weighed a thousand pounds was definitely something worth stopping for. Um, these were neighbors and friends who were all just, you know, chipping in together to, to help the recovery process. And walking back down the street, um, I think I like literally, dead stopped dead in my tracks when I saw this the reporter was a few paces ahead and turned around like what what just happened it's like oh I have to wait and see what is going to happen here um, when you see someone on the roof you stop and this is actually very similar to a photo that I that I made in the aftermath of the flood of 08 um, and I had that in mind while I was taking this photo um, of just you know using whatever tools and whatever you know access point you can uh, to try to your house from the debris. There was actually a neighbor helping him on the ground, um, but I wasn't really able to capture that in a way that, that showed the full context, but the reporter did, did write about that. Um, before Andy shares about this photo, I'll just uh, really quick say that we photographed a number of um, houses of worship, um, and we have kind of grouped together cemetery damage here with that. Um, as, as some of you know, we have a lot of historic cemeteries and those suffered a lot of damage. Yeah, this is um, in Solon uh, by the, I think, I wanna say I was in Solon on Wednesday after the storm, but it, I, I don't remember for sure. Um, but by the time we'd gotten there, me and a reporter, uh, everything was kind of cleaned up. So, uh, because of that, everyone was so quick to clean up, which is great, everyone was helping each other. Uh, I wasn't able to see a lot of um, the damage, but of course uh, this was what was left, uh, what people hadn't gotten to. In fact, I went to a number of houses where people were like, oh yeah, we finished it up last night. And they were just having, literally it was someone having lemonade in the front yard because what else were you gonna do? They still didn't have power. Um, but this is what was left for me to see by the time I made it to Solon. Um, the morning after the storm, I went and checked out Wenceslas, again, knowing that that was a church that had been badly damaged in the flood. I wanted to see how it had fared. 
this was basically the roof of the parish hall. This is Dave and Diane. Um, they're from Amherst, Wisconsin, um, which is, I think, probably about a six hour drive, I think. Um, they actually heard about what was going on in Cedar Rapids from friends who had friends in Cedar Rapids. And uh, they just decided to get in their car and drive and uh, help out any way they can, any way they could. Um, for me, a lot of my, the pictures that you'll see tonight um, that I took, that is a recurring theme and probably everybody else too. Um, it's just that recurring theme of just ordinary average people helping any way they can. It was uh, difficult to get into the driveway at the cemetery. It's pretty much difficult to get anywhere from the down trees and the power lines. Um, you know, you basically turn down one street and see that it was blocked. So you'd have to back up and try another alternate route. So it was, it was difficult going. And Jim, was this your photo from the Hindu temple? It is my photo from the Hindu temple. <laughs> um, it just, again, you know, just, just people kind of using, you know, whatever, whatever they could, you know, what struck me about the picture is, uh, you know, his gloves, you know, they're rubber dishwashing gloves, basically, um, and not heavy duty work gloves. I also, you know, just can see, I don't know, the, the, maybe the exhaustion or the tiredness or maybe, you know, a little bit of despair on his face. You know, that's, that's what drew me to the picture. Um, this is another a church. This is St. Michael's Catholic Church out in Norway, um, which lost its steeple. Um, and if you zoom in, you can actually see the bell in there. Uh, when I flew over, um, they were they were doing work on it. Um, I actually found out about this again. Like there was a it, like it seemed like everything everyone was affected by the derecho, but also. Um, we weren't aware of a lot of things that were um, going on in other places just because of the, I think the communication breakdown, there just was no way to get word from um, anywhere outside of your, your circle just because we didn't have cell service and, and everything. So I actually heard about this, uh, I think from my mom who, um, I think it was announced at mass at her church one one day and um you know then all the churches started raising money for for saint michael's and um and so yeah i decided um when i was up in the plane that that would be in you know we hadn't been able to get out into, into some of these smaller communities and and see some of the damage going that had happened out there so um we, I, I thought it was important to go out and check on, on Norway um, since I had heard about this church and some of the other um, places around there. So back on the ground, um, the first Sunday after the storm, uh, I checked in with uh, two churches that are up on the Northeast side that sustained some heavy damage. Um, and, and we knew that they were going to be having an outdoor service combining the two church families into one. And I arrived a bit early so that I could see the, you know, the damage outside, but I liked being able to show here the pile of debris alongside this more uh, modern steeple. Um, it is, it is a contemporary church, so it's a more modern architecture, um, but being able to show just the sheer amount of debris that was coming out uh, due to that damaged roof that caused all sorts of water damage inside. But the image that really stands out to me 
um, from that particular day is this photo that I took of this family. Um, there was a tent that had like sides on it. And because of COVID, I was trying to make sure to keep my distance, especially from people who were singing. Um, but this, this man, Victor, holding his son, who I later would find out is named Rejoice, um, just really stood out to me the way that he held his hand in the air mirrored by the people behind him um, while still holding on to his very young son um, was just a moment that that stood out for me from from across their makeshift sanctuary. Um, I did find out the family had sustained damage to their home and to their car. Um, and this is a good example of, of uh, approaching for permission and, and gaining that consent from a subject. I, that came up in the course of questions that some of you have submitted. And with this one, this was obviously a moment that I did not want to disrupt, but I still wanted to be able to, to, to make this image. And so once I had an opportunity that was more appropriate, I approached the family, asked their permission and, and got all of their names. And of course, when working in a situation like this, I'm also trying to not disrupt them from, um, from their time. Uh, the next day, I think we heard on Twitter that the Kennedy High School football team was going to be chopping up some trees. So they wanted to get back to practice and they couldn't practice while their field was covered with debris. So um, using Twitter, which was a tool that we used to find out about stories, to find out what was happening, to find out what was open and what was closed, um, ended up leading me to find out about the football team that was converging with axes, chainsaws, and a bunch of pickup trucks. They were very excited. This was basically a workout for them. And I think that, you know, they'd all been pent up uh, due to COVID closures and they were really eager to, to get back to work. Switching gears a little bit, this is uh, uh, Kathy uh, who has cerebral palsy and usually relies on a wheelchair to get around. You see her here with her walker on her front porch. Uh, of course, without power for I think this was a weekend, but for quite a while, um, her and so many other people were affected in their um, medical treatments and just in this case, not being able to charge her power wheelchair, uh, as well as her roommate who also relies on a wheelchair. Um, so a report of ours was doing a story on this and I spent a little bit of time with her, um, kind of seeing what it was like for her in, in walking that balance of, of not going in her home um, I felt that like her front porch here with a um, large drowned down tree from her neighbor's yard in front of her and, and that tree that was clearly tattered in the storm. Um, and when I left, she was doing pretty well. So a neighbor had brought her a generator and she was able to start charging. Um, she couldn't get the thing started, but luckily we got it started <laughs> before I left and went to my next assignment. But um, there were just so many people that were we're struggling with medical medical conditions uh, on top of everything else. Uh, this one, I want to say this is over by Bruce Moore, um, but this is just the the best sight any of us could see was uh, seeing the electric company down the street from you, you knowing that uh, sure it might be a while before you get power back, but just seeing progress. I mean, this was truly the glimmer of hope for I think so many. I think everyone, honestly. Um, so just a slice of that. Oh, and this is Jeff, who um, he also, um, he relies on a CPAP machine to sleep and obviously wasn't able to use it. Um, so he was <laughs> not feeling great, but in very, very good, uh, good spirits. That's his dad in the background, uh, William, if I remember right. He's, his dad's a World War II vet and he himself is a Vietnam War vet. Um, he's also a, a chef. Um, so he had a ton of meat in the freezer and he was grilling for anyone who would take it, whether it was uh, city workers coming by in the trucks, uh, neighbors that could use a meal, anyone. He was just cooking everything he had because it was going to go bad. Um, and it had some volunteers helping clear because he's not really able to do a ton of work. But I, if I remember right, this tree you're seeing on the left, um, I think actually his dad planted. So it was a pretty emotional moment there for them. And, and this is John, who was just a volunteer who heard about, um, who heard about Jeff and his dad needing help. Um, I think on a Facebook group, one of the Facebook groups that popped up, 
and John and I think three of his family members came over and they made quick work of the backyard by the time I was there and uh, we're helping them clear out, which is just a scene we saw everywhere. People, strangers, neighbors, everyone, everyone helping everyone out. This was uh, out at Allen's Orchard. Um, these, they're venture, venture scouts that uh, after the derecho, a lot of the apple trees got blown over. Um, so Chris, the owner, um, was approached by the troop and uh, with an offer to write um, the, the trees and hopefully, hopefully the root system is still connected and uh, the trees survive. Um, Chris said it's still too early to tell if they'll make it or not, probably in the spring, once they start budding again, um, that would be a good indication. But, you know, I just like, it's kind of a humorous moment. Um, the, the two scouts eating, eating apples while they're trying to save these trees. This one, I was assigned uh, to follow along with Senator Joni Ernst, who was traveling around. Um, I believe she was um, going door to door talking, or not door to door, but was going around the neighborhood talking and, and was talking to someone on their porch. And I made a few photos of that and, and noticed this man who was coming from Hy-Vee with whatever groceries he could carry. Um, and I, again, you couldn't drive around a lot of these neighborhoods, not reliably. Um, and he was just making, I think he was making a couple trips a day, he said, just to see what was there. And, and you know, they didn't, he didn't have power like everyone else. Um, and so this was kind of, when you, when you photograph a politician, I feel like you're always on that, but you're also looking around the neighborhood. In this situation, you're looking around the neighborhood to see what's going on. And this is a moment I broke away from that because I thought this was the interesting photo of that moment. Um, and then staying with food insecurity, this is um, over at Vets Memorial. They had a um, Hawkeye community, uh, what's the uh, acronym? They had <laughs> the food distribution site and I was just overwhelmed. This is close to my house. Um, just overwhelmed to come and see. Yeah, hey Cap, thank you Liz. <laughs> I see it in the chat. Um, overwhelmed to see how many people were lined up um, for themselves, for their families, and then how many people also were loading up. I saw an entire, a full minivan, you know, completely full with food for everyone um, on their block, they said. Uh, and then this young man was getting food for him. Him and his brothers were getting food to take back to their mom and I think their neighbor, if I remember right. Um, so everyone was doing everything they could to get food um, back home, back to their neighbor's family, everyone. Andy, that was HACAP, the Hawkeye yep. Area Community Action Program, had boots on the ground immediately and high V. They just did wonderful job. People, people were hungry. They were out of food. Absolutely. Um, this was, I don't remember what assignment I was even on uh, for this one, but I was leaving a neighborhood for something else I'd photographed and came across the, uh, this family and there were two other kids that are riding around on their trikes and kind of playing in the debris while mom was cleaning up. Um, and I came by and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm with the Gazette. Here's what I'm doing. And, and she said, yeah, you know, stop, hang out for a minute. And, and this ended up being the moment that I thought spoke a lot. Just uh, I, obviously I think the kid doesn't quite know what's going on. Um, and mom's trying to kind of hold it together and, and be normal for, not get the kids worried, but also make sense of this. And, and she'd been cleaning for hours, I think. And it was, it was hot. So she's taking a little break there. So um, speaking about uh, photographing politicians, uh, the city of Cedar Rapids had a press conference. I think this was the Thursday after the storm and uh, myself and a reporter were allowed to come into their command center to kind of watch how that process worked. And the mayor came through and this is kind of one of those, like how the sausage is made photos. 
it's not a very exciting photo as the photographer. I'm more than willing to, to say that, but here we have the police chief, the mayor on the right, and then we have two members of the communication staff and they're kind of talking through their messaging, the points they need to hit, like what, what is most important to communicate. And so just getting that behind the scenes look, that's something that our readers were, were really never going to see without us being there to show it to them. At the same time, I was photographing just how the coordination was happening in the command center. And um, so what you're seeing here is uh, an officer who's on the acquisitions team. And what they do basically is rather than multiple different departments in the city asking their own acquisitions departments for something, it's all centralized. So they can kind of pool their purchasing power as well as um, just the, the coordination that's required to get however many backhoes and chainsaws and excavators and everything that we needed. And then the, the governor came for a press conference also at the fire, uh, fire station. And, you know, I, I certainly was not going to share any podium photos in this, in this talk, but I did want to show this that where we have the, the head of the National Guard standing right next to the governor and all of the media are assembled uh, to hear what she has to say, to hear about any updates that we have about when we can expect the National Guard to come and start helping. And then after that, I was able to negotiate to follow along with the governor when she went to visit Kennedy High School. Uh, we had not been inside Kennedy yet. And you know some of these damaged buildings were not safe to go into and we certainly wouldn't go uninvited, um, but, the, the governor and her and her press folks were willing to have me follow along as she view, viewed the, uh, the damage. Um, and this is the superintendent uh, leading the very beginning of that tour. After that was over, the principal very kindly offered to kind of take me around the school and show me some additional damage and some of the early cleaning work that was already beginning. Um, as we remember from the flood, you don't mess with water damage. You wanna get that dried out as soon as possible. This is Shannon Appleby. He's just another kind of regular guy. Um, wanted to do something, you know, as best he could. He wasn't physically able to cut trees or carry limbs or debris or anything like that. So he just, you know, went driving around in his car and delivered sandwiches and water and fruit um, to people that were, were cleaning up. Jim, tell us how you met him. Um, man, I don't even remember actually. That's, that's an occupational hazard I have is that I just don't, don't remember. So if you, if you can help me out, that'd be great. <laughs> I don't remember either. I just, you know, this was a really great example of, you know, of Jim being out on the street, like we all are, and just finding stories just by talking to people, you know, we're not sitting around waiting for reporters or even sitting around waiting for for stories to come into us via Twitter. This was just Jim out on the street. And that's kind of why I really like this photo. I probably stayed a little too long at this, at this particular house, but I just wanted to see how these guys were going to get this giant tree off this house. Um, you know, again, it's just, you know, I'm playing with a, uh, you know, the scale of, um, of the man, you know, with, uh, with the tree and everything. And, you know, just really, really like that late, late afternoon, early evening light. Um, there are about three guys that were kind of involved in cutting the tree down. And, uh, I'm actually glad I really stayed until, until the bitter end, because I, I was able to get this moment and, uh, you know, moment of celebration and cooperation and teamwork and everything. And this is probably my, probably my favorite photo that I took during, during that time. Yeah, this photo, um, you know, even though I wasn't there, I can very much feel this photo. Um, I had neighbors that while I was at work came over and cleared my driveway using chainsaws. It was like, it happened like magic. And so I very much feel that like neighborly uh, collaboration and celebration in this photo. And it was a quick, it was a quick moment. I, uh, I don't even think I brought the camera up to my eye. I just, 
had it kind of pre-focused and I, I just shot. Just another, um, another grassroots effort, you know, people helping people, helping people. Um, this was actually uh, a Lynn County um, initiative. It's the community storm relief effort. And uh, basically it was a kind of a clearinghouse where volunteers could come and they would make, um, make the volunteers into work parties and give them an address and say, you know, go to this address. They need, they need help. They need to get their, a tree off their, you know, off their lawn or off, you know, off the sidewalk or off their house or something like that. So the National Guard showed up. Um, I think the, the most important thing was getting, getting people, you know, getting people's power back turned on. Um, so, you know, I'm just kind of, had several locations, um, no real specific location, but just a neighborhood where the National Guard was was supposed to be working. So again, with the uh, derecho clogged streets, took me a little little while to catch up with them, but I'm, I'm glad I did. On top of that, we didn't actually, you know, still really have consistent cell service. So we were also trying to like text with the public information officer to find out well, where they were and not knowing when we would actually hear back. Um, about five or six days after the storm, um, a website, I don't remember if it was Bleeding Heartland, um, they posted stories from the Southwest side of Cedar Rapids, um, which was our first alert to how dire the situation was there so um, with the assistance of some of the organizations that serve the primarily African immigrant community that lives on the Southwest side, um, I visited the Southwest side neighborhoods with Allison Gowans and uh, we met several families who showed us the inside of their now uninhabitable, very damaged apartment buildings. This apartment, um, is probably one of the most notorious. There were a few buildings that sustained damage like this from the Southwest side. Um, and this is obviously that the top floor of the roof was ripped right off. There was a woman living in this building who had just given birth like two weeks prior. Um, and also in this building were a family of uh, a Micronesian family, um, a, a very big extended family um, and they were climate refugees. And here they are in the Midwest, um, in Cedar Rapids, and they're facing another climate crisis. Um, you know, they're facing the loss of their apartment. And you've probably seen these images. They set up kind of a bunch of tents outside of the building so that they could have a, a safer place to sleep. Um, and we were there when they were packing up all of their belongings to relocate to a new apartment building. Um, so, Meanwhile, the, the kids were actually playing in a makeshift pool that had been made to keep the kids occupied. Um, so that's actually what you see at the right. Um, this image, I feel actually can be a little bit misleading if you don't know that full context that the, the kid is not reacting in horror, the kid is wiping the water off of their face. Um, so kind of this moment of kids continuing to be kids while the adults just try to keep everything together. And that was a theme that we continue to see throughout the recovery. And again, this is the same um, apartment building where we just were in Liz's photo, Cedar Terrace Apartments. Um, and it's one thing, like the images um, from inside their apartments and from the tents outside the building are stark and storytelling. Um, and this just tells another side of the story. Like it's incredible to see an entire building, all these, all these homes with its with its roof ripped off and you can see right into each and every one of these as if it were a little a little toy somehow this is jeremy um he's wheeling a tire that he just patched for one of the residents at uh, westdale court um, apartments um probably you know another another area that very very hard hit on the southwest side of town um
This is Chevy, um, Chevelle Thomas. Friends call him, know him as Chevy, and he's just kind of helping out um, people in the in the apartment complex. He gets some food. He gets some ice um, for their coolers. Just a lot, of, a lot of people helping people. Um, Randy and his uh, destroyed apartment building. Um, a reporter and I went to the apartment complex and we're talking with some of the residents. And uh, I, I just kind of asked if he'd, uh, he'd show us his apartment, um, if he'd take us upstairs to a second floor apartment. And uh, I'm, I'm glad he said yes. Um, I wish I had a little wider lens um, to show a little, a little more of the, the environment and especially the, the roof or lack thereof and the, the sky. Um, but I think the, just the look on his face is, is a very, very storytelling picture. He and his girlfriend actually um, rode out the storm at the bottom of the stairs. Lanisha Castle, um, she's the executive director at the African American Museum of Iowa. And uh, again, we're down on the Southwest side, um, which has a very large um, African refugee community. Um, and they, they have very, very little as well. So she actually brought some, some clothes from her children that outgrew them and was uh, offering, offering clothes to them. We're switching gears. This is um, Tuesday, August 18th. This is then President Trump arriving at the Eastern Iowa airport, um, photographing a presidential arrival. Um, th this is my first time on the tarmac uh, for a presidential arrival. It's, it's a big thing in, in any photographer, photojournalist career, uh, you know, notable day at least. Um, but this was certainly strange because we didn't know for sure when the president was coming. Um, and then I, I think it was about 1030 at night. I had just gotten home from my day at work. I got a call. Um, I was sitting on the couch in the dark uh, with my partner and got a call from an area code I didn't recognize. And I told her that I was possibly photographing the arrival tomorrow. And we joked, oh, it's probably the White House. And then I went in the other room and answered and it was the White House <laughs> giving us details at 1030 at night. But um, it was strange to try to, you know, pick out a nice shirt to wear when I had been taking cold showers and sleeping in the hot, humid house and, and everything. Um, but yeah, it, it was just a weird contrast, a, a formal moment um, like this with, um, you know, what situation I was still in. And then this is actually on the way home from the airport. Uh, I saw a few Amish men were, uh, they had already before the storm been taking apart this barn that was sold uh, for lumber. Um, but of course the storm made that much more of a mess. And so it was interesting to get to talk to them um, about their perspective on the storm. I think this man you see silhouetted here uh, was actually on the farm during the storm and took cover. And, and, and you'll see in the next photo watched a grain bin go flying from, you know, one side of the farm, at least a hundred yards away, probably 200 yards away. And, um, oh no, this isn't the one that had flown, but this one was crushed in its spot. There was another one that had flown and he said did cartwheels across the farm. Um, so it was interesting to talk to him and hear his perspective. These are some line workers. Um fixing mid-American um, energy line, power lines, uh, kind of north uh, or, yeah, northeast of Marion um, along Highway 13 and just south of County Home Road. I was driving back from another, another assignment and I just happened to come across it. And I knew that again, you know, getting people's power back turned on, um, that was, that was a big, big story. So I figured we could use, use some photographs of that. So I pulled off on the side of the road and unpacked my, my big telephoto lens and uh, tried to compress the poles together to, to make kind of an artistic 
artistic photo. Yeah, if I remember right, this was one of the main transmission lines that would help bring power back to Marion. So it was a really, really big deal. I took this picture in my driveway. Um, so somebody in the comments mentioned uh, that they were able to see a lot of stars and without, without the light pollution. So at least that was one, one benefit to not having power is that you could actually look and see the Milky Way and see a lot more stars up in the sky. Yeah, at the end of those really long days, um, you know, it's not like we were going to sit inside of our dark houses. And so, you know, even from inside of my um, relatively urban neighborhood, I was also able to see the Milky Way for some inexplicable reason. I did not take a photo of it. I'm so glad that Jim did. Um, it's really well, astounding what you can see when you're paying attention. It was just, I kind of did it just to kind of decompress and just to try and make, make some art, you know, do something for me, I guess. So, yeah. Interestingly, that's uh, the, the, the next week. Um, that's actually why I went walking around my neighborhood uh, at nine o'clock at night is that I wanted to just see what the neighborhood was like and see if anyone was getting their power back. Um, I think this was like day eight without power maybe. Um, and I came across this crew that was repairing lines in an alley and this was only a few blocks from my house. So we started to feel really hopeful um, it still took another two or three days before we got our power back. Um, but, you know, we walked through the neighborhood and I was walking down 4th or 5th Avenue east of 19th and I all of a sudden heard these kids cheering from inside their house and they were cheering about having light again. And it was like, oh, I want to get home and see if I have light. And we didn't, but it was fine. Um, but it was just really nice to see, you know, these, these families celebrating the return of power, something that I think that we will not take for granted um, ever again. So this is just, you know, a house bordering an alleyway, um, just a really simple, small moment, like a sign of hope um, in the midst of this really tough 10 days that we had been through. And so, you know, I, I made these images mostly for myself, mostly as a way to decompress, um, but also a way to kind of, you know, put to, put to digital memory some of the things that I'd experienced. Um, this was a photo I made out um, as I was just walking around the neighborhood, um, kind of recording how cleanup was going. Um, People have mentioned, and I know a lot of you personally have experienced um, neighbors, how our, our neighbors just like came out in droves and we helped each other. My, you know, I had neighbors that I had never met before who helped me clear trees in my, out of my front, um, front yard and the street um, using whatever we had. I was out there with loppers and I had a neighbor who was out there with loppers and a handsaw and just trying to make it work. Um, but there were also organizations that came from around the country to provide relief. Um, Operation Barbecue Rescue and World Central Kitchen were a couple of them. Um, and I know I took some meals from, from those places and was very grateful for that. Um, this group was the Billy Graham Rapid Response Team and um, they are crisis chaplains from, these two are from Michigan and North Carolina and they had come um, and they, they do this, I guess, as their mission to, um, to help people just emotionally recover from a disaster like this. And so we were just walking by this house and I saw this group of people standing there. And this is one of those situations where I was like, just kind of paying attention to what was going on and um, didn't wanna disturb the moment, but knew that I wanted to capture it because it was important. I mean, I could tell that they were praying and that she was having an emotional reaction. So I just, I made that photo as they were praying and then they like welcomed us over, I was out with a reporter. Um, they welcomed us over to um, ask ask about how we were doing, and then they actually asked if they could pray for us. So we um, 
we stood there and let them pray for us, which was a nice gesture too. Um, so yeah, just, and walking around the neighborhood, just like trying to find moments of, of levity um, and things to, to break up the, um, just the destruction that was everywhere. Um, so that I just thought this was funny. Um, and again, uh, this guy, Josh was 10 days without power and he had been, been recording that on this piece of debris out in front of his yard. Um, that kind of marked a big day, a turning point for, um, for a lot of people. Cause it was just, it's just this round ominous number of, it's a long time to go without power. We had all, you know, thrown out all of our food by that point. Um, again, just up in the plane, uh, speaking of people coming from all over the country to help the line workers who showed up from, you know, as far flung as, um, as Quebec, Canada, um, were just incredible. So we were out in the morning in the plane and it was, it was around like 7 a.m. I think. And um, they must have been having a, a meeting um, off of Mount Vernon Road there um, on the southeast side of Cedar Rapids. And so this was just a group of, of line trucks all meeting before probably strategizing where they were gonna go work for the day. Just an incredible task. Um, and again, neighbors helping neighbors. This is a group of neighbors on the southeast side who um, had all helped, they all were close before the storm and had helped each other clean up um, each other's yards. And then they too just had food that they needed to get rid of. And so um, they decided to have a, a little neighborhood picnic um, in their front yard. Um, someone asked a question about masks and, um, and it, it was definitely a concern, but I think people were trying to give each other space. Also, it was just so stressful um, that, that I think there were just times when we were like masks, 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 you know, like we just have to, we just have to power through. I don't know, other people can speak to that as well. Yeah, um, this is also a photo of neighbors helping neighbors. This is the Wellington Heights Resource Center um, and the woman who was basically had taken the resource center and turned it into a pop-up food pantry. And um, the, the definition of neighbor was certainly expanded during the derecho. Um, word spread that there was food and supplies and people came from all four quadrants um, to just gather whatever supplies they could. You will see here um, pretty good use of masks. All of the volunteers were wearing masks. I was wearing a mask, um, you know, especially if we were going indoors. And, you know, I, I felt pretty safe, um, you know, from a COVID perspective, but I was glad to be able to uh, recognize some of these more like uh, grassroots efforts. Willie Ray, I don't think Willie Ray needs an introduction. Um, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a celebrity, you know, helping, helping people, feeding people barbecue. I think it really, you know, his story, I think, just really had, you know, let people kind of have something to hope for, you know, something to kind of cheer on, um, you know, where's really Willie Ray going to be today? You know, that, that sort of thing to kind of get their minds, minds off what's, what was going on with the derecho. So kind of glad I, I was able to catch up with him. Reporter and I went to uh, an apartment complex, um, you know, a mother and a daughter. Um, it's a very, you know, the, the blue tarps are very, it's kind of a subtle, a subtle picture, but I just, I like the moment, you know, there's maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I just like that kind of that look of hope or, you know, that childhood innocence on the, the girl's face. And, you know, mom, mom definitely looks were, you know, concerned, you know, a little, you know, dealing with uh, some adult, you know, adult concerns, you know, after the storm and everything, but I just, I like the photograph and you get what you can get when, when you're have a reporter standing next to you and just kind of try and make, 
make something out of it. I think I was on, I don't know how many Facebook live um, transmissions, but uh, this woman, um, she and a friend of hers would again, you know, just drive around and uh, deliver meals or drinks to, to people that they think need it. So she gave people hamburger meals, bratwurst meals, um, pizzas, you know, they, they drove around and give it, give, they gave away 50 um, Leonardo's pizzas. Um, she actually even went up to the DOT drivers and asked if uh, they, they needed anything as well. So just people doing what they can. Oh, just a, maybe my wry sense of humor you know, looking, looking for a little, little bit of humor in the, in the madness, I guess. You know, the, Hang on, the I'll zoom in on this. Yeah. For sale, cheap. <laughs> so I think it kind of shows, um, you know, people are kind of thinking the same thing too, is that, you know, they're just trying to find levity where, when it, wherever they can. Um, Bridget, Williams Robinson and her hu husband, Giovante. Um, I was actually, I noticed them activity going on underneath the uh, 8th Avenue bridge here over Interstate 380. And I'm just like, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop. And then one of the days I stopped. So I just, you know, in introduced myself, asked, hey, what, what's going on, what are you doing? And they said they're feeding people. And I think just, again, just a grassroots effort um has really blossomed into into something you know they have their bridge under the bridge um it, it effort initiative now so they 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 didn't ask for donations but this woman drove up and she didn't want a meal she just said here you know i, I want to give you some money so and they, they didn't Br bridget and her family you know her husband didn't ask for donations um, and they, they accepted them up to a point where they had enough money for the next day's meal. And I, I told the reporter about, about Bridget and what she was doing and the reporter did a story and it was published and then television station picked up on it and then she gets a, uh, a food trailer on live national television. So I, I think there, there, there is a benefit, you know, in, uh, in telling people's stories and getting their stories out there. You know, things can happen. This, uh, this is back to me. Um, this is Carmen and her mom, Karen, sitting on the step there. And uh, this is while a reporter and I were walking around um, this mobile home park in Southwest Cedar Rapids. And, and she was just concerned. Uh, she'd taken water damage to her home, wasn't able to live in it. Uh, her boyfriend lived close by and she was staying with him, but just a moment of you know, reflection like everyone was doing. And then this is, I don't remember if it was her truck or someone else's that was crushed and that's her uh, home right there. And she was concerned if they tried to cut up the tree and move it, uh, it was just going to roll and, and do more damage to our home. So there was a lot, a lot going on. And again, uh, this is our mom, Karen, just thinking, like, what, what the heck are we going to do? Who's this? this? It's mine. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just gonna say the, the next few images of mine are are all more cleanup. Um, this was at the Marion Public Library, and, and we, you know, we tried to get as many places as we could. Um, again, another one from above, just trying to. Gra represent graphically the loss of a tree. Um, this was more southeast side cleanup. Um, 
the Wellington Heights resource group, um, you know, got, got volunteers together and were having a cleanup day, just like people could sign up to um, have debris removed from their yard and people would just show up and clean, uh, clean that out for them, which was just amazing to see. This is from the same day, Liz. Yeah, and this is, I was gonna say, this is the, the Johnson Steam Academy uh, principal, isn't it? Yes. Um, so, yeah. So I just like that this uh, showed the, like the real investment that the Johnson Steam uh, you know, Academy has in the neighborhood as well. Mm -hmm. um, something we haven't seen much yet, but um, from above, there were there are several sites around town still where you can see where they where the trucks um, have piled the debris. Um, and this was this is an early stage uh, of one of them on the northwest side time check area. Um, and it, just another one of those things where it's like hard to believe that all of this represents a loss of our our tree canopy. We'll never see we'll never see the mature canopy that we that we did before this storm um, in our lifetimes, most likely. This is also notable um, because that's the river at the very top of the frame there. So you know we're looking at the time check neighborhood and this particular area would have been filled with houses before the flood. Um, and so this is just one more progress photo of the drastic changes that the Northwest side has been through. Liz, it's Mary and I, I, I'm gonna ask you to skip to the last picture because we're almost out of time and we could go okay. on all night, but if you could- Okay, put I know we could. Okay, so maybe what we'll do is um, I'll, sh I'll show the rest of the images quickly. Okay. And if there's something that I wanna say about something, I will, otherwise we'll let you ask a few questions. Okay. We saw a lot of organizations coming in and starting to help. Matthew 25 was prominent after the flood and they assisted with uh, repairs to a lot of homes, including mobile homes, um, you know, showing the fate. Just distributing those food boxes, that's what that was. Yeah, um, and then showing the faces of the people who were impacted, you know, a month later, still with severe damage, um, damage to a business. This one's by Andy. Rebecca took a series of lovely photos of our parks and of the cleanup that was happening there. Um, and, you know, Green Square, especially with that renovation they did, they had these large, beautiful trees that they had saved as part of the, of the park renovation. Um, and many of them had to come down, but it was important for us to, to capture that. And, you know, Rebecca to create this memorial to those trees that had been there um, and then into Beaver Park. Months later, still a home that's that's you know facing very severe damage. Um, this photo is by Andy. Um, Dr. Jill Biden came to visit, so this is this is Biden with Finkenauer viewing damage, and then cleanup. So much cleanup, and this is kind of where we're at right now. Um, you know, we are continuing to cover the planting of trees the cleanup of tree debris, which is continuing every day. I know I heard a chainsaw uh, just down the block. Um, and also photographing, you know, how families are living now. Um, you know, this family that was displaced and uh, was able to get furniture from Central Furniture Rescue. This photo is by Jim. Turning the fallen trees into artwork. Unfortunately, burning some of them, but that's the best option for the severe damage at the Palisades. And then uh, Jim, Jim, do you want to talk about this photo? I was just, uh, again, driving back from an assignment. And I, I like 
traveling the gravel out in the rural parts of parts of the area. And I just, I actually literally st stood on my brakes along the gravel when I saw this. So I backed up and I had it just enough time to uh, take some pictures while the, the sun was setting. So and the, the homeowner actually drove down the driveway and met me in, in the road. And I'm like, oh boy, here it comes. But uh, she, was, she was very nice and very appreciative and uh, very gracious. So I, uh, I actually Facebook messaged her and said, you know, I told her when it was gonna publish. And uh, after it published, she responded and said, it's a beautiful picture. And she, she th thanked me for uh, showing um, parts of uh, rural Iowa. So obviously we had a, a lot to share. Uh, we, we overshot a little bit and didn't leave as much time for questions as we'd hoped, but uh, Mary Sharp, I think is gonna moderate briefly here. Um, very, very briefly. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think we're, I'm, uh, I'm hearing some background noise. I don't know if that's, uh, so. Oh, Mary, you muted oh, Mary. yourself. Oh, that was my fault. Sorry. <laughs> oh. She's back. No problem. Um, I, I'm going to, we had about 10 questions submitted by uh, readers ahead of time, but I think we have time for two. One is, did you get any, and Jim's last picture kind of speaks to that as well as some others. Did you get feedback from many people that you were invading their privacy at a vulnerable time? Steve Gallagher asked that question. That's a really good question. I think that's something that, you know, the the media is accused of often, but I think that at the Gazette, we do that really well. Rebecca spoke to that of respectfully keeping distance um, while she photographed the woman praying. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a matter of gaining consent, but again, this is what we saw after the flood is that a lot of people really just wanted to tell their stories. And, yeah. you know, we are here to help them do that. So we do that as, as respectfully as sensitively as we can. Um, if someone straight up just says, I do not wanna be photographed, that's fine. We, we will certainly move on. I think what was unique about the derecho is that um, every single one of us had a derecho story. So while we're out photographing, people are also asking us, how was your house? And we're able to build a connection um, in that way. Does anyone else have something to add on that one? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's <laughs> And uh, the last question, the last, go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, I was gonna say, just being out in the community and building a connection with people was an important aspect in that regard. Um, I, I remember several times people asking me questions about, about resources and I happened to know what they were and was able to share that with them. And I was like, you know, I got a meal from this, from this group yesterday they they're there every day you should go and get one that kind of thing just like hmm. yeah i think having a, a story to share and having gone through it all together um was important the last question how has this experience changed you carol elliott asked that question i guess for me it's just you know being more prepared, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't have a generator. Well, I do now have a generator. Um, and just, you know, it's, I, I think I'm a little, I think I was always empathetic, but I think I definitely, I slow down a little more and I really, I really want to know, you know, about, about the people I photograph. Yeah, on the note of being prepared, um, I had actually been on a camping trip earlier in the summer and I still had a lot of my camping food in the basement. So when the power went out, that's mostly what we ate uh, for like a week. So I don't think I'm going to take electricity for granted for a really long time. Uh, you know, we, we did what we could with the camp stove. Um, it's not the same. Um, at the same time, yes, slowing down 
um, both in, in how we worked and also just in my, in my personal off work time. Um, every morning, because I had to, I would, I would go outside and I would make coffee on my camp stove on my porch. Um, and those, those few minutes to slow down um, and just to like breathe and to appreciate the trees that were still standing, I think were really key to like maintaining sanity. <laughs> I think for me, um, it brought me closer to my neighbors and my community. I've always felt um, pretty close to the community because I cover it, you know, and I have a responsibility to people in the community to tell their stories. Um, but but this was a you know on a whole new level. I know who I can depend on. Um, and that um, it was it was just really heartening to see people coming out and helping each other. Good. I have a deep appreciation for flipping a light switch and having the lights come on. A deep appreciation. Uh, that that pretty much concludes our program, you guys. And uh, thanks everyone who viewed and. Um, the, uh, the, the program will be posted on Gazette Online. And this is our first program. And uh, so let us know how we did. Uh, Liz Kennedy, who we wanna thank for engineering uh, this evening, uh, will be emailing you uh, an evaluation form if you would fill those out. That would help us do better next time. And the, I'll remind you, free ed, the Derecho books are still for sale at the Gazette store on our website and also at the Heidi drug stores. And that's it. Thank you very much for attending. Good night. Thank you all for attending tonight. And, and thank you so much for, for giving your comments in the chat. And we really enjoyed hearing your experiences too. Yep. And if you had a specific question that wasn't answered, um, our email addresses are pretty easy. It's firstname.lastname at the gazette.com. But I've popped a slide up here that um, has a link to, or the URL, um, to where a lot of our photo galleries live. That's largely sports, but you'll find a lot of news content there as well. Um, in addition to that, we have a Instagram account. So feel free to reach out with questions and please fill out that survey that you're going to receive. We do hope to do more of these uh, type of events in the future. It'll be really helpful to know what kinds of events you would like to see, what we could have done better, and, uh, and hopefully what you really liked about tonight. <laughs> Uh, so, Liz, I, I, Liz, think, I think our next show is going to be on the, the Iowa winning the NCAA championship and <laughs> all four of you photographers being at that. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.